Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me for the last talk of the day. Hopefully, we still have a little bit of energy. Um, it's kind of funny. I mean, I'm sure the program committee obviously scheduled things the way they scheduled it. But Andre, tough act to follow. It's going to be interesting because this is a very different take, actually, on a very similar idea. So hopefully, if you were here for the last talk, you should be able to take some more away because of that. Um, but anyway, so the subject of this talk is NetReap, bridging the gap between Cilium and Nomad. Uh, my name is Dan Norris. I am currently the infrastructure lead at a company called Cosmonic. And so the agenda we'll, we'll kind of walk through here is sort of an overall uh, description of the problem. Like, why did we go about doing this in the first place? Um, and then I'll talk about uh, kind of why we ended up deciding to use Nomad in the first place for what we're doing. Um, and of course, why we chose Cilium. I mean, I think some of that's self-evident since we're all kind of in the same room, but we'll get into it. Um, then I'll give an overview of uh, NetReap itself, um, what it is. It's actually just a re-implementation of the um, Cilium operator. Uh, and then I'll give a quick demo just so you can kind of see what it looks like in action. Um, but the core problem that I'm trying to solve with this particular technology is um, I work at Cosmonic. We are a platform as a service. It's actually WebAssembly. We'll dig into that. Um, but the main problem that I wanted Cilium uh, to be used in kind of our back end is we want to be able to secure customer traffic. Running a platform as a service is a very different, and effectively a cloud platform at that, um, is a very different set of problems um, and requires a very specific set of technologies. And for us, Cilium is one of them. Um, and specifically, what I wanted to be able to do and what my team wanted to be able to do uh, was to be able to secure network traffic um, specifically on Nomad. Uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, Nomad is uh, basically just another orchestrator. It's kind of like Kubernetes, but HashiCorp flavored, uh, so a lot of HCL. Um, there are ways to actually secure workloads on Nomad out of the box. Uh, it's called Console Connect. It's kind of similar if you squint hard enough to something like an Istio. It's a service mesh. Um, you know, it does a lot of L7 sort of stuff, you know, MTLS, all that sort of thing. But it's really more geared towards uh, securing microservice to microservice traffic, which works if you're operating on behalf of a single company, you know, a single set of customers. It doesn't really work if you're actually running customer workloads and like a ton of them and you don't want them to interact in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so for us, it was really came down to how do we restrict traffic based on attributes or for services that we have no idea what they are. Um, and again, like running a platform as a service just a kind of a very different um, set of needs than necessarily what a lot of companies do have. Uh, and so we specifically chose Nomad just to give a little bit of background um, because it is actually simpler and a lot more lightweight to run. You don't need etcd. Um, you can actually deploy the whole thing um, as single sets of binaries. They'll actually um, cluster themselves together if you configure them correctly. That's relatively recent. Um, but the, one of the really big things for us is um, it's, a, it's much more flexible in the way that it approaches um, scheduling and understanding what workloads are. Uh, for example, out of the box, like you can obviously do Docker, um, which is what like 90% of people do. Um, but you can also actually schedule like Java jars natively. You can do QMU virtual machines. Um, you can just run arbitrary um, binaries that happen to be on the host system with fork exec. Um, and the really attractive part for us was that it makes it easy to write what they call a task driver. Um, so in a quick bit of nomad parlance, um, a task is a unit of execution, so it happens to be like a container. Um, a task driver is what actually um, tells nomad how to provide that isolation that you need for any given workload and to do the setup and tear down for a task. So like super simple, if you've ever done that with Kubernetes, you know like it's not really designed for that in the slightest. There are projects that help you do it, but with Nomad, it's really easy. Um, as I mentioned a couple times, right? Uh, I work for a company called About Cosmonic. We're a platform as a service for building distributed applications using WebAssembly. Um, I've actually spent most of my day at Wasm Day for that reason, which is why I was a little hard to track down. Um, but because we run such a unique platform, which is WebAssembly on the back end, um, and almost the entire product that we have actually built and what we are hosting on behalf of customers, um, is built using um, a CNCF project called Wasm Cloud, which we are almost incubating. It's pretty cool. Um, but we also use Firecracker virtual machines to be even more paranoid about it. Uh, this is not a WebAssembly talk. Like, there are ways to do isolation. Like, that's kind of the whole premise of WebAssembly. There's a reason we're actually doing that also with Firecracker. Um, it's mostly due to paranoia. Um, we want to make sure our customers are as you know, safe as possible. 
and don't end up trampling over each other, interfering with us or with um, other customer code. Uh, but we also want to ensure file system and network isolation completely. So give you kind of a diagram of what's going on here and what kind of our back end looks like. We've got Nomad floating around as the orchestrator. Um, it's sitting there basically like behaving like a Kubernetes cluster would, right? Scheduling jobs and tasks. Um, but they happen to actually be Firecracker virtual machines, which are wrapping our customer code that are delivered as um, WebAssembly, or in this case, like Wasm Cloud actors or providers. That's the stuff that like we are running on their behalf. And so, you know, a lot of this is really isolated, at least at the compute level, right? There's no real tampering. There's no way that, you know, in theory and, and probably in practice, there's, it's pretty hard to break out of um, a KVM virtual machine, which is what Firecracker is. It's even harder to probably break out of the WebAssembly boundary, given just how strict that happens to be in the, some of the guarantees we get with Wasm Cloud. But if you notice, there's this big cloud thing over on the right-hand side of this diagram, which is like just floating out there in the wind, right? Uh, Nomad does support CNI, but not really mentioned on this diagram is any of this ingress and egress traffic. Like, how do you actually manage that when you're running customer code that can make arbitrary network requests? Um, and obviously, the answer to that is Cilium. I'm sure you're all real shocked being in this room. Uh, <laughs> we, and um, I mean, there's a number of reasons like why we decided to choose Cilium. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I mean, you've all drank the Kool Aid, so you know you probably could guess. Um, but one of the challenge, or there's a number of challenges when you're actually trying to run Cilium and Nomad. For one, there's not a lot of documentation on how to even use a CNI in the first place. There are very few, I think almost none, that just will work out of the box. I mean, obviously the protocol's there, but in terms of like guides or like how to's, nothing. Um, the other problem is actually on the Cilium side. So I think Cilium a long time ago made what is probably the correct choice to pretty much only interoperate with Kubernetes for the most part, right? Um, and the, I mean, you can run all, all the stuff, and I'll tell you how we do it in a bit, um, but there was one thing that we really had a challenge with and we effectively had to implement our own, and that's the Cilium operator, which is actually um, what's running in your cluster and doing a lot of sort of the bookkeeping behind the scenes. Um, it's kind of like making sure you don't run out of IPs. It handles distributing your network, your uh, endpoint labeling. Um, it also distributes your network policies. And so if you want to replicate that, and I think we saw a little bit of this in the last talk, actually, um, you have to in interact with the lower level APIs for act to actually be able to use these features. Um, the other challenge is actually on the Nomad side. So typically in Kubernetes, when you are running a CNI plugin, um, you know, it's nice. You can actually like run that as a deployment or a daemon set, probably a daemon set if you're saying, um, you know, things just run, you manage it like you would any other workload in Kubernetes. That is not the case in Nomad, which is really annoying. Um, what Nomad does when it starts up is it undergoes a process called fingerprinting. It basically generates um, a static list of all the things it can do. So it basically um, collates all the task drivers it has available. It figures out what OS it's running on. And in our case, it figures out what CNI plugins are available to it. And you cannot change that at runtime. So it has to be available. You can't manage that um, natively in the cluster. It's a huge pain. Um, so what we did is just uh, effectively picked apart the um, daemon set that actually runs the Cilium agents typically in a Kubernetes deploy, like literally just looked at um, what was kind of there. Um, there was some, also some clues kind of in the open source community as people who were trying to run a Nomad, and we ended up just implementing a big systemd um, job that just runs it as a Docker container. Just kind of, we put that on our, v, on our uh, uh, bare metal host and it just works. Um, I won't go into the details because there's a lot of details, but I mean, it's pretty scary, like all sorts of capabilities being added, right? A bunch of arguments. Um, if you've worked with it at this level, it's probably nothing that surprising, but it took a little bit of work to kind of figure that out. And it's just kind of, this is normally what is taken care of for you, which is typically pretty nice in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, another thing that we had to do, and this is more of just uh, something that affected us because we were running Firecracker, and I just wanted to bring it up since this is a pretty network-centric audience, is um, Firecracker expects, I mean, it can do CNI, but at the end of the day, it actually wants a tap device. So AWS, um, which, and that's their open source project actually, is Firecracker. Um, they actually have a um, CNI plugin you can kind of just jam at the bottom of your CNI config. Uh, that basically redirects everything to a tap device. And surprisingly, that all just worked. Like, it, I was shocked. I had no idea it was going to be that easy. Uh, so just in case you're wondering, you can get Cilium through a tap device. Who knew? Uh, so our solution, 
um, if you couldn't figure out from the title, is the thing called NetReap. So uh, I'll get into what the name is and where it came from, but it is open source. Um, we have a project website. You can find it on GitHub. Um, and as I mentioned, it is effectively a nomad-specific Cilium operator. Um, pretty lightweight uh, because you know we aren't going to re-implement it completely everything. Uh, and so we originally chose the name because our primary focus and goal was to make sure that we were uh, cleaning up all of our old IP allocations. And we ended up keeping the name because, like, come on, did you see how metal that logo was? Like, why would we change that? Uh, our main so the main responsibilities of the binary um, specifically is a few different things. Um, cleaning up all of the old endpoints so we make sure that those don't stick around. Um, also cleaning up all the nodes that happen to be removed from the cluster. Again, typically that's something that the operator does for you, but we had to re-implement that behavior. Um, what it also does, that, which is pretty cool, um, is that it also syncs all the network policies for all of the hosts that, um, where Cilium is running. So that way we can update it kind of dynamically and things just work and it's pretty nice. Uh, and it also applies all the metadata that we would want to all the various endpoints where the uh, workloads happen to be running. Um, a lot of this is made possible actually through Cilium's console support through the KV store abstraction. Um, we can, and as we discovered, or well, actually we thought about this, but you can also use etcd. Um, we chose not to because we didn't want to run yet another state store. We're actually already running console. Um, and many other Nomad deployments typically will use console because that's kind of how it was originally intended to be used. Um, nowadays, actually, you can just run it standalone. You don't need that requirement. But again, since most people use it, we felt that it was fine to take the dependency. And mostly that it is for um, storing Cilium state, but also distributing the uh, policies. Uh, quick refresher on endpoints. So, Single cluster manages generally a single subnet. Like, I mean, there's all the cluster mesh stuff. We don't really mess with that. So we're kind of a little bit more stock of a Cilium deploy. Um, so in our case, for example, like we would allocate a subnet in the 172, 2016 range. So, you know, that gets you 65-ish K, you know, ish um, usable IP addresses, which is not a small amount, but it does mean that it's something we want to keep an eye on. Uh, we would have done IPv6, but there's some, it works in Firecracker, but the SDK doesn't really support it, so it's kind of a pain. So we're just like, whatever, we'll just do IPv4, it's fine for now. Um, so NetReap will monitor for all of the agents, which are effectively the kubelets coming up and down, um, and we'll remove any old allocations and um, just remove the uh, old uh, nodes that it needs, doesn't need to keep track of anymore. Um, and it will, in that way, we basically don't need to worry about um, any of the health checks. You don't need to ping nodes that are never going to exist again, right? There's no reason to do it. And that aspect of it is actually leader elected. Um, all the endpoint allocation stuff is per um, agent or per server, right? But only one of them really needs to kind of do the bookkeeping for all the nodes. So we just do a quick leader election uh, using the built-in support and console for that. Uh, and I think we, the last presentation touched on this a little bit, right? Um, but in case you're not 100% aware, Cilium policies are actually stored as one big JSON blob that continually gets updated. Um, so normally the Cilium operator sort of like does all the distribution for you, um, but we need to replicate that. So uh, NetReap effectively just puts a watch on a single KV file and you just kind of like jam a whole big JSON policy file in there. And anytime you want to make a change to that, that just gets replicated to all the nodes and then your policies are updated. Um, there's some weird issues there, but it's, for the most part, it pretty much just works fine. Um, so to demonstrate, right, so here's just a really quick example. I think I just pulled this off the policy generator, by the way. Um, so it's just a really lightweight network policy, right, just IDI3 that's um, matching a back end to a front end. That's really all it's doing. The JSON representation of that is almost the same, right? The only difference is that the... Uh, the name basically is just kind of just another label, right? But everything else sort of flows from there. But imagine on a particular uh, server, right, that happens to be a Cilium agent, if you have a ton of policies, this gets pretty big pretty quickly. Um, it's also very different for us because we tend to hand, or actually not even tend to, we hand write all the JSON for the policies. Um, so it's a little bit different of an experience than um, I imagine most people in this room have with operating Cilium. Uh, so to recap, like, why did we go through all of this? Like, why did we invent all this stuff from scratch and end up using this whole orchestrator that no one else uses? Uh, so the reason was, at least because we were running this platform, 
Um, we want to be able to connect customers to individual virtual machines and manage their traffic individually. And because Cilium, you know, with Hubble and all the tooling, we get all an unparalleled amount of insight into that traffic. Um, obviously, eBPF makes it efficient. That's like half the reason to run it. Um, and also, we get the ability to apply individual policies per endpoint if we want, based on tags and labels. And so all the advantages of Cilium, we wanted to bring that to Nomad and our platform in particular. Uh, so now it's demo time, you know, rock on. Uh, so <laughs> what I'm going to do is I have a server that's already set up, um, actually in AWS, that is just running a single node Nomad server. And it's actually a joint server and um, an agent or a, effectively a client. And so what I'm going to do is just I'm going to turn on NetReap which is actually this one. Um, and then I'm going to just deploy just a very small sample job and show you what the endpoints end up looking like and a little bit about the config of the machine. So I don't, has anybody actually used Nomad in here? I realize I should have asked that. OK, handful of people. Um, so if you ever use Terraform, though, this should at least, like the language should at least look familiar, because this is HCL. Um, all Nomad jobs are defined in HCL. Technically, they actually are JSON. They get converted. But this is how normal people end up writing them if you don't love giant piles of JSON. Um, so in here, the only thing we really have to configure, and most of this is all boilerplate, um, the only thing we really have to configure in here that kind of um, is of interest to this audience is the CIDR that uh, NetReap happens to be managing. So in this case, it's just going to be uh, 172.16.16. Um, then, of course, the image and um, the other big thing is you have to mount in the Cilium socket so that it's able to communicate with the Cilium API. So uh, I will go ahead and just apply that on here. So I'll do a Nomad plan, NetReap, right? Go ahead and run it. Well, there we go. It's just about up and doing its thing. Um, and so the example app we're going to run is actually just a slight modification of um, actually what the Nomad one will do out of the box if you just like do Nomad init. Um, so in here, just to demonstrate some of the capabilities, um, like in Kubernetes, you can apply arbitrary key value pairs in this meta block. This can be repeated. So in this case, I'm just applying uh, effectively a label called cosmonic.com slash app name. And the value of that is Cilium.com North America 2023. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through a lot of this. But um, of interest here is the fact that we are actually running it as a CNI called Cilium, I've reconfigured the config for that. I can show it to you in a second, but I mean, it's basically the stock um, Cilium like conf list that you'd normally use. And that's really it, right? And the other thing, too, is also like, uh, in theory, you ha have to, if you're depending on how you're keeping track of your IPs, you also give it like an address mode if it's per allocation. That's very um, nomad specific, so I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm happy to talk about that um, outside of the scope of the presentation. But I'm going to go ahead and get that started as well. So do Nomad plan, and we'll do example.nomad, get this kicked off. Takes a little bit because it's got to um, actually configure itself, get the CNI all kind of good. Usually does take a little bit, especially if you don't actually give it a health check. Kind of sits there and just makes sure it's making progress. So there we go. So now it's healthy. Um, so. Let's do a Cilium status real quick. If I could actually type the word Cilium, which I cannot. Auto <laughs> my history to the rescue. Um, so this particular uh, Cilium cluster right, is really just one node. It just happens to be the node that it's running on. Um, but it is connected to um, a console server, which is also actually running on the same node. Um, you know, Scoop Redenies is very much disabled. Um, I'm running a pretty recent version of Cilium. I was playing around with like bandwidth manager and stuff on here at one point. Um, and then WireGuard, of course, works. It's how we run it. Uh, but you can see, where is our, we have a couple IPs used, right? So let's go check that out. Um, if I just do endpoint list, like what we would do normally, um, it's a little compressed on this view. Um, it's still readable. Uh, but anyway, so we have just you know our normal health check and, and the um, what's reserved for the host, right? But this is our running container, right? So you can see it pulled an IP address from the range we pre-configured. Um, and then all the labels are actually set up. So NetReap itself will set up three specific ones out of the box, right? They're prefixed with um, the NetReap source. In this case, it's the job ID, um, the namespace that it happens to be running in, and then the task group. Um, 
nomad jobs can be comprised of task groups, which can be comprised of tasks. So that's all metadata that happens to be useful, um, kind of in the general case. But also you can apply your own. So that's prefixed with the nomad label. And that's that same label that I had in the job uh, definition before, SigmaCon North America 2023. Um, so that, that's basically it running. And so uh, I do have a policy set. Um, I'm just going to go get that. So, oh no, scrolling that doesn't really work well. Anyway, the policy itself is not that important. I think we all know that Cilium policies work and they do what they're supposed to. Um, but I'm just going to apply a new one and I can show you that if I do, um, if I actually update the policy that happens to be stored at this particular key, uh, netreap.io, netreap policy in console. Oh no, it's because I moved it. There we go. So that did actually update that key. And if I do another get, right, this is revision nine. It was revision eight before. NetReap, because it had a watch on that key, automatically read that. And if we had more servers actually joined in this cluster, it would have just written that all out um, to all of them at once. So that's pretty neat. We basically, for the most part, re-implemented everything that we needed in order to get NetReap to work out of the box, or not NetReap, Cilium. Uh, so future work, we've got a couple things that we'd like to do. Um, we don't want to be able to document um, some more specific Nomad features, uh, specifically ACL support. Um, we also would like to investigate what it would take to um, generally recommend etcd on Nomad to replace console. It is, I mean, there's a Helm chart, right? If you squint hard enough, you can convert that over into like a Nomad spec. Um, but we have had reports from people who are, are not just us who are running um, NetReap and um, Cilium in production on Nomad saying that um, at a pretty high scale, especially with the way that we're kind of putting watches on a single key, but even many keys, um, that's where console tends to somewhat break down and etcd is much more efficient. Um, I mean, anecdotally, from what I was told, these are people who are running like tens of thousands of containers at once, turning like gigabits of traffic at like, I don't know, across like tens or something of machines. It's pretty significant, right? So I think we'd want to be able to actually have some concrete recommendations for people running at that scale. Um, other thing I want to do is also be able to break up policies into multiple keys. That way you can behave, make it behave a little bit more like network policies are in Kubernetes. You can just kind of define the ones that you care about for a particular workload, right? And let NetReap kind of take care of distributing that and making sure they end up where they need to end up. Um, another thing that would be great would be bandwidth management support. Um, that I believe depends on a label in Kubernetes that ends up sort of percolating throughout the rest of the system. I did some investigating work on that like several months ago. Um, didn't get that far, but it's something that we would definitely want to be interested in um, being able to implement for ourselves and being able to use. Um, and then lastly, like we'd love to be able to contribute upstream. Um, the reason that we went about this in the first place was just it felt like a really big lift for us to write a different version of the Cilium operator and kind of have that actually upstreamed in, in the project. But that's not to say that we wouldn't be willing to do that or find other ways to kind of make this more of like less of a cosmonic specific effort and more of a community effort. Um, it is obviously open source. So it's not like anybody can't use this. And again, people are besides us, but I think we'd be really interested in seeing how other people who are running Nomad would be interested in running Cilium and getting some more, uh, um, like interaction with the community. Uh, I wanted to quickly shout out to, to uh, Taylor, who's still here, I see, uh, for helping me to write this in the first place. Um, also, Dan Everton, I believe he's at GoDaddy, rewrote like half of this to make it more efficient and better, um, which was pretty cool. Like We were shocked that we got anybody using this besides us, honestly. And of course, everyone else who's contributed, there are a few other people, and um, certainly internally and externally, who have uh, helped us out. So with that, a um, couple resources. So if you want to talk about this more, um, we have a Discord that we run specifically for our product, but it's also where our NetReap discussion happens. Um, if you want to learn more about Wasm Cloud and sort of like the underlying stuff, um, there's this QR code, which takes you to Slack. Uh, and of course, the project uh, website is over on GitHub, uh, Cosmonic um, slash NetReap. So feel free to check it out. I mean, we're, pretty I, we're mostly pretty responsive to issues. I try. Right? It's hard when you're a tiny startup, but I'd love to hear what other people would be interested in using this for, and certainly contributions are more than welcome. Uh, with that, any questions?
Come right here. Uh, nice talk. I think thanks, thanks. For, for presenting. It's, it's like super cool to see um, you know how people can kind of pick up Cilium and mm -hmm. then like recognize what the value is and just be like, oh well, this little piece like doesn't work, so yeah. let me just like substitute in. I think we saw that in the previous talk as well. Yeah, like, basically, it's like awesome to see. Um, uh, yeah, when I was listening through, I was, I was the main question I had in mind was actually like from a Cilium community perspective, how can we facilitate this stuff? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if there's like you and other members of the community who are all interested in maintaining the stuff together, um, certainly happy to like facilitate some discussions about whether, you know, where, where should that live and, mm -hmm. and are there better ways to contribute and so on. Uh, I think one big thing that has changed upstream in Cilium, probably over the course of while you've been developing this stuff, um, is we've kicked off like a major modularity effort in terms okay. of the Golang structure of things mm -hmm. like the Cilium agent and as well as the operator. Okay. So I think some of the early maybe struggles you might have had is like, oh, everything just says like, you know, well, it doesn't even say if Kubernetes, it just assumes Kubernetes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think what the operator, like the upstream op operator is doing now is, is it's a lot more modular based on this like high cell model, which we've documented, documented yeah. in, the, in the documentation. So um, in terms of being able to enable some functionality um, and then hopefully abstract that, there might be ways to share more with NetRe, but like, I don't know. I, I haven't looked in detail, so you know, if, it, if it's interesting, we can certainly talk, talk yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, I'd love to follow up on that. Uh, um, yeah. For context, I think we wrote this originally against like Cilium 111 or 112, so it's been a little while, and I know there's been a ton of activity going on in the project, so it wouldn't surprise me if some of it has kind of changed enough to make it a little bit easier to integrate into. But yeah, I'd love to talk about that, and then potentially, I know, you tend to get that scary message when you actually start Cilium with like, hey, by the way, a console is deprecated. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, we, we were about to rip it out when you guys came by. Yeah, so I know. Like, All right, well, let's, let's not rip it out because people are trying to use it. I remember um, talking to you about and, that. Uh, but like, it continues to be like, hey, you know, if, if the community is happy to like contribute yeah. and you know, submit patches and if you're hitting issues, like, you know, contribute to that. Um, if you're looking at moving to etcd, then it certainly re-raises that question. Because it's, it's, it's just code that I think a lot of the Cilium upstream community doesn't really exercise. Yeah. So it's always that question of like, how far can we kind of go on, mm -hmm. on you know, supporting yeah. that? I think it'd be interesting for us to kind of get involved and see. Like if mm -hmm. it's, for us, like I think at some point we'll probably have to switch if it is in fact like, um, or if we replicate sort of that behavior that other people have talked about, it just like it just isn't performant enough to be using watches in console, then yeah. Um, that's probably the way that we'll go and just do at CD and kind of deal with it. But it would be interesting to kind of get involved and kind of help out there and see who else is even trying to use it. Because, I mean, I'm sure you don't need to maintain that code if it's just like a handful of people here and there, or at least you don't want to. I, I, mean, know I think the unit tests are probably, well, like we have some system tests. That yeah. are, like that's one of the main users that actually exercises that I'm, that I'm aware of. But, okay. Uh, it's certainly good to, good to see uh, mm -hmm. other examples. So thank yeah. You. Anything else? Hello, knock knock. Uh, hi, I don't really have a question. I have a thank you for using Nomad. Oh, uh, sure. I'm a Nomad engineer, so we should talk. We should talk, yes. Yeah. Um, you guys are always maybe... after us to open source or Firecracker driver. I heard that a bunch at a different conference. Oh. Yeah, nice. <laughs> well, cool. We'll talk after. Anybody else wants to talk about Nomad? Hit me up. Oh, one right here. Yeah, sure. To repeat, um, it sounds like he's interested in uh, implementing an operator specifically on Libvirt and wanted to know a little bit more about how we op um, approached it. Uh, so a lot of it was really like we're, we kind of we took a look at the, what the existing operator did and tried to figure out like what did we actually need because we didn't need that much, right? We, like we we threw out leader election and then we kind of re-implemented it afterwards once we realized we actually needed it. But a lot of our focus was specifically. Uh, making sure that we had all the endpoint metadata and we were cleaning things up and then making sure all the policies were um, distributed. Those are actually two different, um, or actually, let me step back. There's a couple, it's written in Go, right? So there's like a couple different Go routines and things that are actually happening there. Um, specific, like there's a whole thing for endpoints, there's a whole thing for nodes, and then of course the policies. And like that's pretty much how we ended up breaking it apart and deciding like that's how we approached actually writing it. Um, the code itself, at least from what I remember, was pretty straightforward. Like if you look at the upstream operator, 
So I imagine you'd probably be able to figure it out fairly quickly, but of course, you've got a template. So feel free to ask questions or ping us in Discord or Slack too. Happy to chat about it. Yeah, of course. All right. Something I, I wanted to mention, and I told Andre before, is it's amazing to see Cilium being extended. But in addition to extending Cilium, a large value of what you, you shared today is educational, because the low-level implementation of Cilium, whether in etcd or the low-level API of the agent, are not well known by users. And I think they're actually pretty simple once you get to know them. And I think it would be very valuable if people know, knew them better. And I think these examples show that it's, it can be done and that it's, it's very valuable. And, and on this, thank you very much. Yeah.